Do you want God's maximum purposes to be fulfilled in our time together? Or are you enduring through till the end? <laughs> this is a moment of truth, isn't it? If we want God's maximum purposes to be brought forth in our time together, we will have been praying fervently daily for that to happen in faith with a deep burden from God. If we haven't been, we're probably enduring. God wants to stir us tonight, not massage us. There's yet very much more land to be possessed. He has been making it very plain hour after hour that he still hasn't completed what he started. And according to our desire, our intensity of desire to want him to be fulfilled, we'll need to move out of the enduring stance to the diligent seeking stance. To the condition of heart that says, God, I don't want you to be disappointed. I don't want to go from this place with your having to say, I tried and I tried, but they didn't really want my maximum. God's maximum has to be prevailed for. It has to be wanted with intensity of desire. We have to stir ourselves up always to be seeking his face for it. With that in mind, he has led me very, very clearly to give the message tonight on what it means to have a lover relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I was asking him several days ago, what is the absolute antidote to idolatry, which he's been speaking to us about so strongly? in these last two weeks. And he flashed back the answer into my mind. God as lover. And the more I have thought about that, and then he started to give this message to me. The more I have thought about that, and particularly this afternoon, as I've been in a concentrated uh, capsule of time alone with God, he has shown me that there is no way we can have two lovers. Now, I knew this before, but he showed it to me with greater uh, strength this afternoon. We cannot have two lovers. Either he is the lover of our soul, and therefore there is no idolatry, or he is not the lover of our soul, and we have some idolatry. This is a black and white message. And I would ask you to... Be very, very honest before God tonight and put down uh, on a piece of paper as we go through some little indication that in honesty that God knows anyway, but just agree with God, with what he knows, as to whether you actually are living the, this relationship of lovership with God. Because if you're not, you'll know there is an area of idolatry yet to be uh, dealt with. And God wants us to be so uh, desperate before him that all forms of idolatry in their most subtle form be revealed to us that we would seek him as though our life depended on it tonight following this message and during this message. That we, we, may, me, we may want to be rid of every subconscious, unconscious, hidden form of idolatry that we can truly say God is the lover of our soul. How do we get and keep a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? We have to recognize that it starts with him, not us. We love him because he first loved us. There's a verse in Song of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 10, that has been quickened very powerfully to me and has probably brought more uh, 
how can I put this, more of a of faith in my heart that I can live a lover relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, than any other verse of Scripture because of the revelation he gave me. And I'm going to give it to you for that reason. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. He wants to explode revelation to us on that, that verse. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. We know that we are beloved of the Lord. We know that. But do we really understand with revelation what it means that his desire is for us as individuals? Regardless of shape, size, color, nationality, where we are spiritually, cold, lukewarm, hot, fervent, whatever state we're in, shape we're in, nationality, wherever, what our background, how we are at this moment, his desire is for every single one of us. And it is that we may have a lover relationship with him. He created us for intimate friendship with himself. That out of the overflow of that intimacy of knowing him, we may be empowered by the Holy Spirit to make him known. So he therefore, next thing is, that he will therefore pursue us until this happens. Because of his making us for intimate, creating us for intimate friendship with himself, we are, and we are going to be part of the bride of Christ if we pursue this. He's preparing us now through intimacy of relationship with himself, a lover relationship, to be able to function as his bride throughout the ages of eternity. Our uh, relationship with him here, I believe, determines greatly the effectiveness of our relationship up there. I believe that with all my heart. What on earth is the judgment seat of Christ for if it didn't, if it doesn't? And he will pursue us. Listen to Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord appeared to him from afar. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued or pursued my faithfulness to you. It is part of the pursuing faithful love of God that we are here listening to this message from God's word tonight. Wooing us to intimacy of friendship with himself. Wooing us away from all idolatry. And the word of God goes on to say he will keep on pursuing us and yearning over us and grieving over us with longing in relation to everything that hinders this lover relationship with himself. How many times, I think it must be uh, on three different days that God has turned us to Hosea chapter 10. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called, we can put our names in there, the further they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. You think of the idolatry that has been revealed in these days and what we've confessed, and yet there is more to come. And they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize. It was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from the neck and bent down to feed them. Hosea 14, verse 8. Oh, Ephraim, oh, and he puts my name and your name there tonight. What more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. And we hear the yearning heart of God pursuing us further. And then he says, will they turn to Egypt? Back to Hosea 11 verse 5. And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? If we refuse to press into God to see what we cannot see, of our idolatry, so that we may repent of it, he has said that he will judge us. When I have finished speaking tonight, this message, um, Tom is going to read to you two very pertinent and powerful scriptures that God gave me yesterday morning. One, when Tom started to speak, when I was seeking God with intensity for a breakthrough amongst us. 
And second, the second scripture that he will read to you is when he sat down and called us to seek God for personal conviction. And God gave the second verse, which he will give us later. But you will see from those scriptures that God is saying to us that we will come under his judgment if we, if we do not repent of the idolatry that he is calling us to seek him until he reveals it. Our greatest need tonight is revelation. It has been our greatest need from the first morning we met together or the first night we met together. It is the revelation of what God is trying to say. It is the revelation of the gift of conviction tonight. That would be the greatest gift that we could have. Revelation of everywhere in our lives where he is not the consuming passion and number one love of our life, which will be manifest as we have already found in the teaching that he's brought to us by our behavior patterns, as well as what goes on in our mind. Will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? We will come under his judgment and he can use the enemy to do it. And again, when uh, I need to tell you that when Tom and I, uh, in a, at least an hour and a half's time this morning, minimum, that we were seeking God with intensity together in relation to tonight, God spoke to us very strongly from the word of God that just as Solomon lost those tribes that were, uh, uh, that were initially under his rulership, the majority of those tribes, to Jeroboam, because of idolatry, God was taking us back to what were the idols that Solomon had that, that caused God to take away the responsibility, the leadership, the authority from him. And one of the major things was the, the foreign gods, the, the idolatry that came through whom? Who did it come through? His wives. And God warned him and said to him, if you go in, if you take foreign women to be your wives, they will turn your heart away from me. What did we learn um, several nights ago when we were having this, the messages on idolatry? That idolatry is heart estrangement from God. And what did he do? He took no notice, he disobeyed, and the word of God says those women were used just as God were warned to turn his heart away from God. Now, when I have finished, Tom is also going to share with you um, a powerful thing that God showed him many years ago that he spoke into a strategy conference in Youth Mission to leaders about what some of those uh, foreign gods are that the women turned, was used to turn Solomon's heart away to. And the word of the Lord came through Tom some years ago on that, and God reminded us of that this morning. And he's going to share that with you so that we may get the impact of what God is saying. So really, we are du Tom and I are duetting under God tonight. That's how the, uh, this evening is uh, going to flow. I love that. I love teamwork. Swords will flash in their cities, will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, not turn from serving me. Me. Heart. Devotion. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. Then listen to the heart of God. How can I give you up? And then we put our name in there where he is. God Ephraim, how can I hand you over? How can I treat you like Admar? How can I make you like Zeboam, like the others that I have judged? And then you can hear the, the compassionate heart of God yearning over not wanting to bring judgment to us, not wanting to take away the plan of the university of the nations from us. My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. You see God's dilemma 
of his justice and his righteousness that demands judgment. Then you see his mercy coming from his love. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. God is saying and has been speaking to both Tom and myself in relation to this two things. If we will not stir ourselves up to seek God and pursue him and press in to get the full revelation of the idolatry that is still here, he will come and judge us. And at the same time, he is speaking this verse here to show his dilemma. He is jealous over us. And I'm not going to go over that because we've already covered that in the teaching. But he feels... he. His, his jealousy is that he wants this undivided devotion, heart devotion to himself. <clears throat> How do we get and keep a lover relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? We've seen his part. Now from his part comes our part. We make time to get alone with him. There is no intimacy of friendship with anyone without getting alone with him with them. There is no lover relationship with anyone without getting alone with the person, the object of our love. We're not talking about flashes in the pan of the fact that we haven't been alone with God as a way of life. And I see uh, spiritual leaders often doing this. And because they're so dried up and there's no real lover relationship with God, then periodically they have three days of prayer and fasting uh, to, to try and get back the relationship that they'd lost, only to lose it all again, to have another day of prayer and fasting six months later or a year later. That's not what we're talking about. That's not how lovers work in a relationship. God waits to see whether we will make, a, as a way of life, a priority of every day, regardless of the circumstances, alone with him. Deuteronomy 4.29, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Hebrews 11 and 6, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Song of Songs, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. I know no book in the word of God that so gives us the pictures and the understanding of what it means to have a lover relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Song of Songs. Listen to, the, to these verses here. I all night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. This is the kind of intensity of pursuit to know God on a daily basis to be alone with him that God is wanting from us. I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now. And go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them. When I found the one my heart loves, I held him and would not let him go. Got out of bed to pursue in the cold, in the dark, in the night to find the lover. That's the kind of intensity to know him that God is requiring of us. Psalm 27, verses 4 and 8. One thing, says David, with this pursuit to know God in an intimate lover relationship, one thing, I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. That's not a little glance at Jesus. That's not casually inquiring in his presence to know him. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. We will never see by revelation of the Spirit the beauty of the Lord and be a casual inquirer of the Lord. We'll miss his beauty. And to seek him in his temple. Seek him just for him. Just to know him. 
just to understand him. Song of Songs, again, chapter 2, verse 14. Now this can be God speaking to us and it can be us speaking to God. I don't care what interpretation of the word you have it. It's per it fits perfectly either way. If you want to have it as God pursuing us, longing for us to know him, fine. If you want to have it as us seeking God to know him, fine. But listen to these words. It works both ways. My dove in the clefts of the rock. That's extremely significant. Where are the clefts of the rock? They're not the obvious places. They're the hidden places. This is, God wants us to get alone with him in the secret places where nobody else is. Not just seeking him with others in group ways. That's good. That's right. That's fine. It's good. It's God. But it's never a substitute for seeking God alone with him in the cleft of the rock where there's only room for you and him. In the hiding places on the mountainside. That's not where the others are. It's not where any others are. The hiding places are alone with him. He's seeking us, our seeking him. Show me your face. It doesn't matter whether it's God talking to us or us talking to God. He wants us to say, show me your face. And he's saying to you, I want to see your face seeking my face. Let me hear your voice both ways. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Our faces are lovely to him as we seek him. His face is, will become lovely to us as we seek his face and want to hear his voice. Psalm 27 again. Verse 8. My heart says of you, not my mind. This is devotion we're talking about tonight. My heart, my soul, my innermost being, my spirit cries out and says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. It's very important that we see what God is wanting to say to us tonight about this word face. That's not his mind, and it's not his hand. So many times we come alone with God, desperate to know his mind, and that's right, and des more desperate often for the provision that he can give us by seeking his hand. That's not what God is talking about tonight. He's saying, seek my face, my face, my face. Why? The eyes are the mirror of the soul. I said many, many times in Youth with a Mission and out with youth, outside Youth with a Mission, I don't read lips, I read eyes. The eyes of the, are the mirror of the soul. You can be talking to somebody saying all the right words that they love you and appreciate you with their mouths and their eyes are as cold as a dead fish. And a person can look at you and not say a word with their lips and you know that they're loving you and appreciating you. Eyes are the mirror of the soul. And God wants us to get to the place where we want to see his eyes, the mirror of his heart that I explained to you uh, the day we had the intercession in the first week from Habakkuk, when I talked about the white, hot, burning fire of God's love and his holiness portrayed in his eyes. Do you want to see those eyes? They're part of his face. It doesn't matter whether he says anything to us. If we could have the revelation of those eyes. Holy and love and burning with the fire of both. 
And God wants us to seek him with such intensity to know him and to understand his heart by seeking his face. That he's telling us from his word, it's not going to happen in a group situation. It's in the clefts of the rock, in the hidden places on the mountainside. You and I only know God to the extent that we've spent intensity of time alone with him over a lifetime, seeking him. He rewards the diligent seeker with the revelation of himself. And we see his face. And we pant and yearn with desperate longing for that amazing moment when we shall see him as he is. And then even more amazing, be like him. He's wanting us not to be shocked he wants the shock, to the inevitable shock, to be minimal. How do we get and keep a lover relationship with God? We don't just talk all the time business to him when we're with him. We tell him that we love him. We tell him why we love him. We tell him we believe him when he tells us that he loves us. And believe me, friends, he's telling us he loves us all the time, all day, in one way or another, in the pursuit of his faithfulness, in the way he pursues us for this lovership. In a thousand ways he's speaking that he loves us. Do we believe him? Second Chronicles 29, 11, My sons, do not now be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence. What for? To minister to him and to be his ministers and burn incense to him. Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and, ver and verse 4. Take me away with you. This is God pursuing us and talking to us. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into... I'm sorry. This is us talking to God. This is the, this is the type of uh, language that God wants us to have in relation to the programs of life that we have to live through in order to know God and make him known. But our time alone with God should be like this, because it should be the highlight of every day. And this is the language he's longing that we would say, take me away with you, God. I'm longing for this time alone with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers so that every other time of our life as a way of life is less full of wonder than the time alone with him. You see, we can know God in many other relationships and think there's no idolatry. We can know him as creator. We can know him as savior. We can know him as king. We can know him as shepherd and guide. We can know him as captain. We can know him as advocate, high priest, and intercessor. We can know him as master. We can know him as friend and know him very, very little as a lover. And we can know him in all those other ways but lover and think we know him closely. But it's only when we know him closely that we're longing for that aloneness with him. Lovers do. I have watched the only engaged couple that I know of that are here. Isn't it um, um, Chip and, and Carol? Karen? I don't know of any other engaged couple. I love that precious couple with all my heart. And many, many times I tell them, and they have told me they're not tired of my telling them. If I've said, are you tired of my coming up and telling you how much I love you? And they've said, no, we love it. And 
I've yearned over them during this conference. They're lovers. They've been brought together by God. And I haven't spoken this to them nor anybody else. I'm just telling it all out now tonight. But I've yearned over them, and I've thought, oh, that precious darling couple, they have so little time or place or any opportunity to be alone. We're always all there around them. And I've thought, well, God is just. He'll make it up to them some other way and give them more time. And they're so sweet, and they don't look as though we bug them or bother them. But they're lovers, and they long to be alone. Are we like that with God? Do we yearn for the time where we can just be with him? Do we say, we rejoice and delight in you, God. We will praise your love more than wine. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16. This is why we have this book in the Bible. It's for the purpose of the fulfillment of this message. Solomon, Song of Solomon 2.16 My lover is mine and I am his. Do you know that we could meditate on these pearls of verses in the Song of Solomon and have such a, an overwhelming sense of God's love for us and the lovership that he longs us to come into, it is only meditating on these verses slowly and at length and repeatedly that revelation has come to me to be able to give this message. I've given this message many times before, and the revelation has been given years before, but oh, there's the freshness comes to me every time. I give this message of the wonder of the language of the Song of Solomon. And my heart is stirred and my whole being yearns more than ever for an intimate relationship with him through meditating on these verses. My lover is mine and I am his. I meditated upon that this afternoon and I wrote down these words. Tremendous ownership and security of belonging. And I thought of the single people amongst us, either those who have never been married or those who have been married and have lost their partners or have been divorced or whatever, and you're not married now. And I thought, how, how just of God that he created every one of us that we would be, would be and could be absolutely equally fulfilled regardless of marriage or out of marriage. And we can be fulfilled, and we will only be fulfilled, married or single, to the degree we experience this message tonight. Why is it that so many times we see nuns or people like that who've taken a vow to be separated to the Lord, who often have the most radiant faces? Have you noticed that? You take the Sisters of Mary. You go to the community of Jesus on Cape Cod. If you want to see radiant, shining faces of a, of a lover relationship with God, you look at some of those women in that community who have, at the call of God, taken a vow to, be, uh, to never marry. That's their call from God. They're being obedient. They're not saying that's for the rest of the world at all. They're not advocating that. They live in a community with many, many other married couples in community who have been called of God to be married. That's balance as far as I can see. But oh, the radiance that is on them. And it, it's coming from their lover relationship with him. Why is it more they have it than those who are married? Is it that the idolatry is with the partner or always wanting to be with others and not with him? This is the kind of talk God wants us to have when we're alone with him. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. 
know what that means? Many things, I'm sure, but this is what God showed me again this afternoon. That, we, that he wants us to sit at his feet alone with him and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to receive the expressions of the love of my heart. I, I don't want you just to read my heart, which you know is that I love you. Because lovers need to communicate, and out of the abundance of a heart, the mouth must speak. It's not sufficient for us to say, God, you know I love you. And it's not sufficient for two lovers to never ever say, I love you. Out of the abundance of a loving heart, the mouth will speak. And God yearns us for to say, I not only love you, but these are the reasons why I love you. I, I want you to hear my outpoured heart to you. This is, come into my garden, Lord Jesus, and, and listen to the fruits of my heart as I speak, lover talk to you. The Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 10. Verse 10, my beloved is all radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. Take the word of God. If you feel awkward, take the word of God and read it to him. Can you imagine us being relaxed as his bride if we're awkward with lover talk down here? What kind of a honeymoon is it going to be up there if we, if we just can't relate to him in this intimacy here? Verse 16 of Song of Solomon. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. That's the one where the huge revelation has come to me that excites me the most. That makes me want to feel, that makes me secure the most, that wants me to pursue him because I'm convinced he is desiring me. And from his desire of me, I want to, I want to pursue him back. Now, you might say, the last thing I feel like at this moment is that God is desiring me. I'm wiped out. I'm exhausted mentally, physically, spiritually. I'm enduring through. It's all been great, but if I could just get on the plane to make it and get to home to bed and, you know. Friends, he understands how we feel. It's been a tough schedule. He understands. But listen, he wants you to come to him tonight just as you are, and say, just as I am, Lord Jesus, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you are bidding me come to you. O Lamb of God, I come, just as I am. Will you come to him like that tonight? That's what he's saying. Just as you are. He's wooing you. He's wooing you by his spirit to seek his face. Have you ever taken a piece of paper and written down reasons in the presence of God where he has proved that he loves you and written them down? It's an embarrassingly long list. Let's stop and sing because God wants us to really be convinced. I mean, not just in the head, but in the heart tonight that he loves us and wants us to pursue him just as, just as we are. Well, let's sing just as we are without one plea first and then sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Just as I am without one plea, you may stand if it's easier for you, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. A little quicker and with conviction. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Thank you. Stand or sit or lie or however you want to be comfortable. I was in Switzerland at the chalet up the road where I was speaking at a YWAM school of evangelism on this subject once many years ago. And I asked the students to write down the, the ways in which God had proved himself that he loved them. And then I asked them to share some of the things. And I will never forget one husky, uh, hairy chest kind of macho kind of a guy get up and say these words. And I recorded them. I love it. He said, Jesus is not only beautiful and lovely, he's far out and heavy. <laughs> God loved that. Absolutely loved that. And I thought that's the most fabulous uh, picture of God. He is that. He's just that. He's not only beautiful and lovely, but far out and heavy. Isn't that the most perfect description? I think it's terrific. Tell him that in however you want to say it. That was the way he felt. And God wants us to just, but open your heart up and get it out however you want to say it. He, he, it will release you and it will fulfill God. And that'll get us on the road to this relationship. The next thing is that we share the things on our hearts with him. Our lover is the first person we go to in need on this earth if we have a lover. And God wants not the lovers on earth, not the best friends on earth, because there again, that's idolatry. He wants us to, to instinctively go to him first. If he is a lover, we will. Psalm 62, 8. Listen to his invitation. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Psalm 142, verses 1 to 3. I haven't time to repeat this, these scriptures. So you'll have to get the scriptures from a tape if you want them. I cry with my voice to the Lord. With my voice I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. He's, he's not going to be mad with you. He's glad that you, that you are treating him as a lover. When my spirit is faint, thou knowest my way. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now, not only do we share the things on our heart with him because he invites us to, but oh, for a far greater reason. That would be reason enough. But there's a greater reason that God wants us to know at this point. Take down this sentence, will you? Because of God's infinite knowledge of us and unfathomable love, he has infinite ability to understand us. Because of his infinite knowledge of us and unfathomable love for us, he has therefore infinite ability to understand us. Now when we really believe that, we are going to come and pour out our hearts to him knowing he's going to do something about it. And you know, what we need when we are in trouble is not so much somebody, first of all, to give us a whole bunch of answers. We can press a computer and answers can come out. We don't want that kind of thing. What do we want first? We want understanding. 
We may be in a total mess. We don't want answers first. We want you to say, someone to say to us, listen, I understand you're hurting. I understand. And God has infinite understanding because of infinite knowledge and, and unfathomable love. Listen to Job chapter 36, verse 5. Behold, God is mighty and does not despise any. Okay. He is mighty in strength of understanding. Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. At times, we may feel God is a stranger to us, but at no time are we strangers to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Again, I will never forget the revelation as God exploded this into my mind and heart. The last part of this verse. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully. And here came the revelation. Even as I have been, meaning already fully understood. We are only know in part now and understand in part, but he already fully understands us now. Are we believing that? N listen, nobody else does. That's for sure. You're allowed to say amen. Is anyone awake? No one else does. Listen, no one else can. Only God has infinite knowledge, unfathomable love, and infinite, unsearchable understanding of us. Pour your heart out. Do yourself a favor. And when we really grasp that he fully understands us, as nobody else does, then we won't hesitate to ask him for things that we need that other people may not think we need at all because they don't need them or may have not have the understanding that God is neither poor nor mean. And they may think he is poor and mean, therefore don't ask him for those things. I was teaching on this in Kona, Hawaii, at our YWAM base there, to one of the schools. And I said, go on, let's, we'll stop right now. I haven't got time to do this with us. I wish we had, but we don't have that time. And I said, come on, we're going to stop right now in the middle of this message and ask God for something you want. He's your lover. And lovers give extravagant things to one another. Have you noticed? I'll never forget when I was engaged to Jim, I had 75 cents at the beginning of the week less left to last me through to the end of the week. I did the most crazy thing in the natural, but lovers do these kind of crazy things. He desperately needed a, um, a robe, a warm dressing gown or a robe, and it was winter time. And I saw one in a classy menswear store over the road from where I worked. I had 75 cents. I didn't know where I was going to get my, my bus or my tram fares as it was in those days or how I was going to pay for my lunches or anything. I tore over the road and I, I gave my 75 cents as a, a down payment on the best camel hair, uh, most expensive robe in the store. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I had to borrow money all the rest of that week to get through. I felt terrific. Lovers. God wants us to come and ask him for things. And I stopped and I was telling this, the students this. I think it was a crossroads school or an LTS, one of the two. Anyway, I think it was an LTS. Anyway, uh, Peter Jordan and Donna were there leading the school. So that, whatever school it was, crossroads, okay. They were there, and they were in the act. They weren't going to miss out on any of this lover business. And they asked God silently, quietly, separately, and then found out each one had asked exactly the same thing. They said, lover God, we desperately need a break from all these responsibilities here in YWAM Kona, and you know that, and we haven't any money, but we ask you to give us uh, at least uh, a three-night 
holiday, hotel holiday and a break over a weekend. Please send us the money so that we may escape for a weekend on our own. And each ask the same thing, may convert. Thank you, love of God, we believe that you will do it. Do you know the next day a man walked straight up to them? They hadn't told one single soul what their request was. He said, yesterday I had a strong impression come to me from God that I was to give you money for a three nights and a hotel holiday for a weekend. Here it is and wrote out the check. Do you know what happened? Nobody reacted. Could we worship or praise or say thank you God or something? That's God answering prayer to two people who believed God was a lover. Do you know what else happened? Do you know what else happened? Now, the Jordans had been on that base for seven years. And they said they have never seen this happen ever before. Nothing remotely like it. The day after I gave the message, which was the day they got the money for their hotel weekend away, a man arrived unknown to the rest of the staff in Youth with a Mission, they don't know who he was or anything about him, arrived with how many, wait till I get the facts here, exactly. I don't know how many, but dozens, dozens of peach roses arrived on the Kona base for the women of the staff. Do you remember that, you girls? Dozens of peach roses out of the blue. What? And of course they ran and told me. I knew what it was. It was God sending somebody to do an extravagant lover deal. That's what it was. Because there was no other explanation. Who are they for? Just for the, the ladies on the base here. That's what lovers do. Oh God, ruin them for every other relationship. I pray in Jesus' name. Let's get excited about you so we can repent of all this idolatry. Thank you that you will. Jesus stopped and prayed in the middle of preaching. It's scriptural. The next thing is that we listen to what the lover has to say. It's not a one-sided relationship and conversation. Mark 9 verse 7, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Psalm 81, 11, but my people did not listen to my voice. They would have none of me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that they would walk in my ways. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, his speech is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. Do we want to hear his voice? You know, when you have a lover relationship with someone, it doesn't really, and you're parted from them, it doesn't really matter what they say. You just hear them. They're talking. I don't really care, and I mean this with all my heart, and God knows this. All heaven backs this. I don't really care what God says to me, as long as he's talking. I just want to hear the voice of my lover. What he says is relatively incidental as long as the love of God is still in communication. The next is there's a depth of communication beyond words where we just say an endearing term to each other and it means everything. At times in deepest worship to the Lord Jesus, or in times of the greatest agony of soul, have you noticed what we say? Hands up if it's just Jesus, because we don't know what else to say. If it's at the height of worship or the depth of agony, just Jesus, just his name. That's part of lovership. What I say, in agony of soul, I always say, just Jesus, Jesus, there are no other words. When I'm in agony of mental, emotional, or physical pain, it's just Jesus is all I can get out. But when I'm in ecstasy with him because of the way he is revealing himself to me in an in intimate lovership, I always say, you're too much. You're just too much. I just don't have any more words. And he knows when I say that, that's the ultimate. 
I don't know why you should be hearing my secrets. I don't know why. <laughs> well, the next is we share secrets. Oh, no, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 3. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved young, among young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Now, before we, in the Song of Solomon, it was that he was coming into our garden, and the fruit of our telling him how much we loved him was sweet to him. This is the opposite now. It's, it's his... Um, with great delight, we sit in his shadow, and his fruit is sweet to our taste. We come and, and we listen to him say, just your name and my name. Have you ever heard him say that? Just your name. Just as we say Jesus, he'll say. Do you know who he did it to on earth? Does anybody know? He just spoke a name, and it meant exactly this. Mary. Magdalene. That's behind the word Mary. It was the revelation of the lover relationship that they'd had and experienced on earth. And he just spoke her name. And she knew that when he said Mary, oh, that's the voice of my lover. That's my lover. And she fell. We share secrets together. Psalm 25, verse 14, The secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. He not only shares his secrets with his lovers, but friends, he shares his burdens. Have you ever gone and sat before the Lord and said, I not I'm not asking even for your secrets right now. And that's part of love a relationship. You can do that. What are the things on your heart? How I could more fully be used to know you and make you known? Or the people I lead or anything. That's one level. But here's another one. Have you said, lover God, my most intimate friend in all the world. I'm coming here because of my love for you and my friendship with you, to share your burdens with me. For you to share your burdens with me. Man, that's a mark of friendship. We can want friends, close friends, to share secrets with us, but how many want to share the burdens? How many of us want to take the, the burdens of the, one, of the one? How many people can we say, I have no revelation to give you at this moment. I just have a tremendously burdened heart. Will you share it with me? Will you weep with me? Will you take the burden that is on my heart? Only our closest friends can we say that to. So many are so busy and so everything else they, they, and so burdened, they don't want to hear one other burden. But if we really are very, very close with a person, we know we can say, I have a burdened heart. Will you share it with me? And we know if it's at all physically possible, that person will stop and share that burden with us or share it at a time when they can. That's a mark of intimacy of friendship. But do we do with this with God? Do we say, God, what's, what's breaking your heart? Friends, I pondered this afternoon as God was giving me a lot of fresh stuff for three hours this afternoon on this message. I pondered what would have happened had we done that in this last two weeks if we had just come together and sat before God and said, Father God, share what is breaking your heart with a lost and dying world because this University of the Nations is to reach a world. That's his purpose. The nations of the world. What is it that's breaking your heart? What are you yearning over? What, is, what are you sad about? What are you weeping over? Would you share that with us? And we had waited till he had broken through and broken our hearts with what his heart was breaking. Oh, what revelation we could have had. 
We talk so much. And we wait and listen. And wait until he breaks us. And until we feel his heart, not just hear his mind. This lover relationship is a heart thing, not just a mind thing. He's yearning for the kind of friends who will weep over what is breaking his heart. Have you noticed that when your heart is soft and compassionate toward a person, with the, with the heart of God in love, you can quickly get his mind to help the person. You can struggle for hours trying to get God's mind to help someone if you don't have his heart first. And if we will concentrate on wanting to have the heart, our heart right, and our hearts broken, and our hearts soft, and our hearts in tune with what is God, breaking God's heart, he'll, we'll get what is in his mind us to do over this lost world. Thank you. It's right. I, I buy my watch what I have two minutes or we've just gone over, have we? Thank you. Um, I can I'm submitted to you and to Lauren. I have three brief what I feel are pertinent points that would complete I think that we'll just finish here if you want, but if you, but unless you have, if you already have a strong uh, witness that before these, th the, these three are brief at the end, but very important. If you feel now's the time, I'm very relaxed to bring them in. If you've got that impression, come right up. That would be enough for me. Have you? You, you don't have a strong impression that to come now? Are you sure that's not why you stood? All right. Okay. The last three of these. We want to do things for our lovers. In other words, we love to obey because we love him. It, this takes the whole thing of serving him for any lesser mo mo motive right out of it. We love to obey God because we love him. The, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. If you love me, you will, and I always think of it like this, you will automatically obey me. We know that, friends. We could all quote that. But he's longing for, for obedience not to be a struggle but to come out of a, a lovership relationship with him. The, the next one is, it's of the utmost importance to us what God's reaction is to our actions at all times. That's what a lover relationship produces. The utmost importance to us what God's reaction is to our actions at all times. The fear of the Lord is the only thing that will ever bring us to this kind of love, a relationship level with God. No other way. Because the fear of God is being more concerned with what God thinks about us than what man thinks about us at any moment of time. One aspect of the fear of God. And the last is, we want to talk, I'm sorry, the last is that Lovers not only give extravagantly to each other in relation to gifts that are costly, but have you, and where money is involved, but what else can we give to God extravagantly apart from money? And we can. Someone said it, time. I was so moved just a, a few weeks ago when I was um, team teaching with my very close friend, Dick Eastman. Oh, we love each other so dearly and so deeply. And uh, we say it all over the world. We've got nothing to hide. 
precious Dick Eastman. How he loves Jesus. When I think of him, I don't think of all his ministry of intercession. I think of his love for the Lord Jesus, out of which his life of intercession flows. I was very moved as Dick was teaching recently about the woman who broke the alabaster, well, there were two women that broke alabaster boxes of ointment at, at his Jesus' feet, oint, precious ointment. And the one who, who it had cost her a year's salary, that ointment was being spread and put on Jesus. All right. And Dick said... I, I, one day I wanted to show Jesus how much I loved him and he'd be meditating on this woman with the year's wages, with the extravagant gift. And he said, Jesus, how can I show that I love you in an extravagant way? What can I give you today? And the Holy Spirit said, your time. And he said, how can I give you my time today? It was a normal, very busy day. Do you understand? Nothing like business as usual on the schedule. And the Holy Spirit showed him he could spend the whole day, put everything aside, and just worship him. And he did. And he picked up a guitar, and he says, I'm no great guitarist, but I could play enough to, and he, to get by. And he said, for the entire day, I did nothing else but sing love songs of worship to Jesus all day. Now listen to this. I was paralyzed with interest nearly, when he said it was a year to the very day after giving that whole day singing love songs to Jesus to the day that God told him to say yes to becoming the head of um, world literature, thank you, world literature crusade and taking on the responsibility of a whole worldwide movement of leaders all over the world. And Dick wasn't slow in putting the two together. What did Lover God do? Started to think up a way that he could take Dick into greater uh, intimacy of friendship with him and give him greater privileges and responsibilities to make him known because he had given a whole day out of a busy schedule just saying, I love you, Jesus, and singing it to him. Boy, does that say anything? You talk about a, a lesson on leadership development. You've got it right there. At least Lauren agrees with me. Some of you are saying, I don't need any more responsibility. <laughs> My answer to that is, listen, part of intimacy of friendship with him is taking his loads, and that includes responsibility. And if you don't want the responsibility, you don't want the intimacy. But don't let the responsibility stop you from the intimacy. That's what God is saying. All this is that we may finally be terribly concerned if we're not in this relation, intimacy of relationship with him and if he's not speaking to us. Are we concerned? Do we just go on, can't hear his voice, don't have an intimate relationship with him? Well, we'll just serve him more, have more vision or more programs where he's pushed out into the shadows. Luke 2, 41 to 44, Mary and Joseph didn't notice Jesus wasn't with them until a whole day had passed. And many Christians are the same. Song of Solomon 5, verses 2 to 6. And with this we wrap it up. He can withdraw his sense, the sense of his presence from us in our lives if he is ignored as a habit. Did you get the weight of that? He can withdraw the sense of his presence from us if we ignore him as a habit. And second, at least, um, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 to 6, is the story of the, um, sh the Shunammite woman here. I slept, my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. She's in bed, and the lover's knocking on the door. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. This is the Lord Jesus calling us to take time alone with him. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. And she says, oh, I've taken off my robe. 
Must I put it down again? He calls us to intercession. He calls us to worship. He calls us to seek his face, to know him. He calls us to study his character and his ways from his word that we may understand him. And we say, I washed my feet. Must I soil them again? It's not convenient to seek you now. My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my lover and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover. When we come to try and seek him, when it's in our time, what happens? My lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. The presence, the sense of the presence of God departs. I looked for him but did not find him. I called him but he did not answer. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. I can't bear it now. But I didn't come and, and listen to him and be with him in his timing. I said my timing and I can't find him. Repentance of the idolatry of other things that have taken the place of him and crying for mercy will be the way to get back that relationship. Thank you, Tom. Nehemiah 9, 1 to 3. And the descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. And Joy received this passage as we were sharing about the, um, the sins that come down, the influence through tradition and through the cultures and through the teaching that we have received. And then a very strong warning in Job 36, from verse 8. Job 36, 8 through 12. And if they are bound in fetters and are caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions that they have magnified themselves. And he opens their ear to instruction and commands that they return from evil. If they hear and serve him, they shall end their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they do not hear, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. They shall die without knowledge. In Kona, a few years ago, we had a seminar with Dr. Glenn Martin from Marion University, who was giving us his biblical Christian worldview and philosophy of education. It's such a powerful message and has been the, influ the inspiration for our worldview schools. And as he was sharing his message, the, the thought kept coming to me, how, how biblical will we be in this university? How biblical will we be? How radically obedient will we be is another question. And I wonder if in this passage there isn't one of the reasons of drift hazards as Dr. Ward put it. There is uh, sometimes human tendency to go so far and then stop. To say, I've done it, I've done this much obedience, and that's enough. Especially if we are not seeing the fetters and cords of affliction. But there is a warning that the end shall be without knowledge. This could be also a summary of the history of the Christian university. A verse that was just passed up to us that someone received this afternoon without knowing anything about the, the message tonight is Joshua 7 and verse 13. Joshua 7 and verse 13. Rise up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, There are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. And of course, this is from the defeat at Ai. Israel went up, thought they would win relatively easily, and were defeated because things had been taken. Idols had been taken in and kept. 
When Joy received the passage this morning on Solomon's wives, I was struck because I gave a message with that title three years ago, almost, in Kona, at the strategy conference, and then I believe to the staff as well. And at that time, I was trying to think at why there were so such separations in the academic disciplines, even in Christian schools, where the theologians don't talk to the church growth people. And the counseling people are even further out in left field. And wondering why these, these the, the Christians, some of whom have the same stated goals, haven't been able to get along. And one of the heads of department of a major Christian university said this in an address. He said, it's, the, it's because we have different cognate disciplines. That's just a Latin word meaning the same root, cognate. He was a church growth man, studying how the church grows, especially in missions. And he says, we don't get along with the theologians because our root discipline is sociology and their root discipline is philosophy. So it's not really that we don't agree, it's that our root disciplines are totally different. And that's where I got the thought, I think inspired by a message of Lynn Green that I'd heard the week before, that we have married Solomon's wives, not just personally, not just organizationally, but in the worship of our minds, it has been given over to other gods. As the cognate discipline of theology is philosophy, church growth is inspired from sociology, Leadership training is inspired from management, fundraising inspired from marketing, counseling inspired from psychology, training itself inspired from the science of education, missiology inspired from anthropology. Does that mean we shouldn't have anything to do with these? No, it does not. But we are to take the tribute, not enter into marriage. We are to take the riches, not the wives facts, not the theories, the research, and not the presuppositions. Let's go before the Lord and ask him what we should do next. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this word tonight of your wooing us, your drawing us to yourself. Your, the love relationship that you desire with us. Thank you for this calling that came forth, the, the joy, the tenderness, the, the sweetness that came through this message. That we can feel the depth of the longing of your heart. Lord Jesus, Show us how to respond. Draw us to you right now. By your Holy Spirit who leads us into truth. I pray for the fear of you upon me once more, that I would not quench the Spirit of God working in me.
It was early in the two weeks that we've been together that the Holy Spirit showed me something that is going to take place. It has been confirmed by leadership. We don't know the timing of this, but sometime before we leave, this is what we're going to do. And you will then, if we share this with you, you will have a deeper understanding of why it's so important, so crucial at this time that we seek God with intensity for the revelation of where Jesus is not lover and where there is idolatry. Uh, if I ex explain to you how we, this, what we're doing now is preparation for, before we leave at some point in time, we're going to be in circles and we're going into spiritual warfare. And it will be in relation to the idols over that what I saw was like a whole, na a, a, a whole group here, for instance, warring against the principalities behind the main uh, idolatry, on, like in China and another circle we're having USSR and another one, India, and uh, or in uh, relation to the Muslim world, either ethnic groups or land masses and nations or continents, however the Lord shows us. But covering the, the major areas of the world in the strategy and detail that he will show us and that we were all in intensive spiritual warfare, smashing these strongholds and naming them out, the principalities behind the, uh, the idols as uh, God brought so clearly and powerfully to us that understanding through Tom yesterday morning. But friends, this is what the Lord has shown me so clearly. Put it on me early this morning and all throughout today. We will never be able to go into that battle. In fact, we could be overcome by the very principalities. If ourselves, like the, the seven sons of Sceva, if we ourselves are not rid of the idolatry in every form that God wants to show us. If we, when we see what he wants to show us by our intensity of desire and stirring ourselves up to seek him for revelation and conviction, then God will bring it. Then from cleansed hearts, filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll go into the warfare and see the powers of darkness and the strongholds broken. Now in light of that, does it make it make it so much more sense how crucial it is to do our homework here now. And I want you to know that when Tom and I were seeking God in that um, hour and a half this morning, when we were asking God to confirm whether what was in our hearts about this extra stirring ourselves up at a psychologically zero hour you know, for us in a conference, we're tired and nearing the end and the whole business. But if God wanted us to stir ourselves up before him, to seek him with greater intensity, for greater revelation in relation to idolatry than he's given us, than we've ever had to this point in this conference. If that was his will, we asked him to speak. And do you know what he turned, he turned me to immediately in the word of God? The very word that I brought to you, on the night that I spoke on idolatry, the first night, on what were, were some of the reasons God brought us together as a group for, on that very first night, remember, it was King Asa and the prophet that was with him was one of the scriptures that God gave me. That's what he turned to me at today. And what, did the, did the, what was King Asa doing? He was already calling the people to seek God. And what were the people doing then after that? getting rid of the idols under his leadership. And what did the prophet do? Come in and say, I encourage you. You're on the right road. Seek him. And get rid of the idolatry. What did they do? With greater intensity, they sought him. And with greater intensity, they got rid of idolatry. If we want more confirmation that what we're doing tonight is the will of God, I don't know what it would be. We've had the word of the Lord confirmed over and over. We're right in line with what the word of God, through the word of the Lord, by his spirit, through those who diligently sought him, are saying. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, just in obedience to his direction, preparing us for the big battle.